Welcome to chapter 35, Water and Sugar Transport in Plants. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to explain how differences in water potential drive how water moves in plants, discuss the two components of water potential in plants, explain how water potential, surface tension, cohesion, and adhesion contribute to the process of transpiration, and explain how active transport, osmosis, and differences in pressure contribute to the movement of sugars in phloem tissue. All right, so um, transpiration is the process that moves water from the shoots, uh, sorry, from the roots of plants to the shoots. And transpiration is driven by um, differences in water potential, which we're gonna talk about today. It is also driven by evaporation of water from the stomata of leaves. So as you remember, leaves have holes in them called stomata, stoma singular. Um, and transpiration should occur whenever the stomata are open so that carbon dioxide can be taken in, and transpiration should occur whenever the air surrounding the leaves is drier than the air inside of the leaves. Okay, so this is the process by which, um, so it's drier outside than it is inside, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about why that is so as we go through the chapter. All right, so what is potential energy? Mm, it's like energy that you're not using, but you could use to do stuff. Like, they're always like, you got so much potential if you'd only just get up. But no. Um, okay. Kind of. Went a little off track there. Oh, it's, uh, energy due to, like, position or molecular structure or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's pretty close. All right, so if you, um, took 1113, you would remember that um, that we had a bunch of different examples of potential energy in that class. So for example, in terms of positional energy, if you're at the top of a diving board, you have very high potential energy. And if you jump off the diving board, your potential energy goes down, 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 down until you get to the bottom. So your potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy. Um, so you have energy that has a high capacity for work when you're up high and less as you go down. Um, diffusion. So, um, again, if you have like a whole bunch of molecules that you've all pushed into a single corner, right, they're going to gradually move apart from each other just by, you know, kind of, um, random motion in all directions. And so the process by which you have stuff that is together versus being diffused is a form of potential energy. And then finally, if you have a complex molecule, um, that is very structured, um, then that harnesses, that has potential energy, and then that potential energy um, can be converted into kinetic energy as that large molecule is broken up into little molecules, okay? So up here, we have um, greater capacity to work. These states are less stable, so things will go from a state of higher potential energy to lower potential energy, and you have more free energy. Remember, that's the Gibbs, remember? Gibbs free energy, higher G. Go down here, less free energy, a more stable state, but less capacity to do work. All right, so water potential is a kind of potential energy. It is the potential energy of water in a particular environment. And we have a very specific comparison. So we're comparing our water to the potential energy of pure water at an atmospheric pressure and room temperature, okay? Um, so this would be at zero megapascals. And um, so we would say that um, using that kind of um, standard condition as a comparison, that the net movement of water should always be from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential, okay? So water moves from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential. Okay, um, we have two components that go into water potential. So two things that influence where water is gonna move from too. Okay, where's their high water potential, where's their low water potential? One component is called solute potential, and the other is called pressure potential. So poly solute uh, potential, so this is a letter psi, psi sub s. This is the tendency of water to move by osmosis in response to differences in solute concentration. Okay, um, and so if you remember that water tends to move from areas with a high solute concentration to a low solute concentration, right? Um, solute potentials are always negative numbers, 
because we remember we talked about what we're comparing them to, we're always measuring them relative to the solute potential of pure water, okay? So solutions that have high concentrations of solutes have low solute potential, okay? Um, so you remember water goes from high, areas of high water potential to low water potential, right? Um, so if you have a solution with a high concentration of solute, it has a low solute potential, right? And so water is going to want to go there. So water goes from areas of high solute potential to areas of low solute potential. And just logically, we know that water tends to go from areas with not a lot of solute, we'll say like not very salty to very salty. Water is drawn from not salty to very salty, okay? Um, so we can also see this, you know, when we look at cells. So here's our cell. If it's in an isotonic solution, it means it's equally salty inside and outside the cell, right? So there's no net movement of water. The solute potential inside and outside the cell is the same. If you take the cell and you put it in pure water, right inside the cell, you still have like a bunch of ions and it's, you know, a little bit salty, right? So the cell solute potential is going to be low relative to its surroundings. So it's saltier inside than outside. So the water is going to want to come in. Water goes from high solute potential to low sol solute potential. Water goes from outside to inside. All right, high solute potential or low solute potential? Oh man, this is so confusing. Okay, so which way does the water want to go? It's going from high to low. Okay. So, does this have high solute potential or low solute potential? I guess it's got the low solute potential. Now it's got the high solute potential. What about this one? I guess it's the highest. What's the highest number? Zero. Yeah, zero. Okay. Um, so water goes from high to low solute potential. Water's going to go to here the most strongly, a little bit less strongly to here. Not going over there at all, okay? Okay. And so if you think about it another way, this is a really negative number. That's the kind of a negative number, and that's zero, okay? All right. Um, the other component of water potential is pressure potential, so that's psi to the P here, and that's the tendency of water to move in response to pressure. So in a cell, um, you have pressure potential in, in the form of a, a wall pressure opposing turgor, pre turgor pressure. So the turgor pressure is that the cell is really, really full, and the water is pushing out on the cell membrane, but the wall is keeping the cell from bursting, so it's pushing back. So this is inside the cell, so the cell is really, really full, and that's bulging out the wall, but the wall is really strong and it's pushing back, okay? So we have wall pressure, the force of the cell wall resisting the cell getting bigger, and then turgor pressure, when the, wa the, the cell is swelled up with water, um, it's the water pushing out on the cell wall, okay? So the water is gonna wanna move from high pressure potential to low pressure potential, okay? All right, so in each cell, which is larger, wall pressure or turgor pressure? Well, look at that one. It looks like the turgor pressure is like making that cell all explode. Yeah, so it's probably bigger, right? Yeah. What about this one? Oh, I think the wall is winning. Okay, so you think the wall's bigger? Yeah. All right. You are correct. Okay, um, so the potential energy of water, wherever it happens to be, is going to be the sum of the pressure potential and the solute potential, okay? So there's psi to the P and psi to the S. All right, remember I already told you that solute potential is always negative because it's being compared to pure water, right? Because the cell is always going to contain some solutes, right? And so the solute potential within the cell is lower than that of pure water, and so then pure water will move into the cell. All right, the pressure potential from turgor pressure is gonna be positive in living cells, okay? So the turgor pressure is gonna be pushing outward. Um, it should be noted that's not 100% that's not of the time true because um, if you have a dead cell like xylem, um, one of the vessel elements in xylem, the pressure potential might be negative um, because it's a dead cell, but we won't worry about that. All right, so here is some stupid um, kind of memes I came up with. 
And so we can all appreciate that it's real dumb to have to recite things, and we'll all recite them ironically, but hopefully this will help us remember, okay? All right, so I'm going to say them once, so I'm going to point to you, and then you say them, okay? All right. All right. Solute potential is negative. Oh, me. Solute potential is negative. Spin. All right. Solute potential is negative. Spin. All right. Pressure potential is positive. Pressure potential is positive. PPIP. Okay. Pressure potential is positive. PPIP. All right. Um, water moves from high side to low side. Water moves from high side to low side. Water moves from high side to low side. All right, the last one. Salty solutions have low solute potential. Salty solutions have low solute potential. Salty solutions have low solute potential. All right. All right, let's talk a little bit about how we can mathematically do problems with water potential. So let's just say we have a flaccid cell, so it has no turgor pressure, okay, and its size of P is zero megapascals. Okay, so that would be like this cell over here. Um, so if you place it in a solution of pure water, water is going to enter the cell by osmosis. Oh, I'm sorry, this was referring to the cell before anything happened. Okay. If you place the cell in a solution of pure water, the water is going to enter the cell by osmosis, right? So the incoming water is going to create turgor pressure. So our cell starts out flaccid, okay? And it is saltier inside of the cell than outside, so the water comes in. And it comes in, we'll say, um, with a potential of minus one megapascals, okay? What's going on with the outside? Um, nothing, the pure water is not changing at all, that stays the same. But then the flaccid cell is minus one. So outside, it's zero megapascals. Within the flaccid cell, um, it has a, a total water potential of negative one megapascals, right? So net water movement is into the cell. So water always goes from areas, um, from areas with higher water potential to areas with lower water potential, okay? Here's a higher water potential. Here's a lower water potential, so water goes from here to here. Water goes from here to here, okay? Similarly, in um, the old school YouTube, which we talked about, I think, at 11.13 a bit, um, this is a tube that has a membrane in the middle, and then there's solutes over here, these little red dots, but the water and the water can go back and forth, but the solutes have to stay on this side, okay? So this side is pure water. And this side, um, you have a solution that has a solute potential of minus one megapascal, and so um, if you add, you know, remember that your total water potential is your um, uh, size of P, water potential um, due to pressure, plus your size of S, your water potential due to solutes. And so you add these two together and you get negative one megapascal. Okay. And so it's basically showing that the water wants to go from here to here. And eventually, if you leave this long enough, this water will actually go up higher on this side. Okay. All right. So this will continue to keep happening um, until the system reaches equilibrium. And at that point, the net water movement uh, stops, okay? So at that point, the positive turgor pressure um, plus the negative solute potential will equal zero. And so functionally what that means is eventually um, the turgor pressure of this cell will be enough so that no more water can be allowed in, okay? And in this case, the pressure of gravity will not allow any more water in this way, and at that point, then the water potential will equal zero. Okay, so in this case, you can see here that, oh yeah, so we can, if we were to put a plunger on it to keep it stable, it would stay the same, and in this case, the cell wall opposes it, and it, um, basically, the cell doesn't get any larger, and then psi um, oh, sorry, should point out here. So when we've um, added a cell wall that's exerting pressure to oppose the turgor pressure, we've added a size of P of 1 megapascal, okay? So when the cell fills up and then the cell wall opposes the turgor pressure, 
now we have the size of p of 1, and so this plus 1 and this minus 1 equals the total water potential of 0. Similarly, if we were to take a plunger and push this water down so that it wouldn't rise up higher than the other side, we'd be exerting pressure with a power of 1 megapascal, and that would counteract the solute potential, and then you'd end up with a total water potential of 0. Okay? All right. Let's say that the value of psi in root tissue was found to be at minus 0.15 megapascal. If you take the root tissue and place it in a 0.1 molar solution of sucrose, and we know that the psi for the sucrose is minus 0.23 megapascal, then the net water flow would be dot, dot, dot. So what do we do? Is there like some kind of equation? There is some kind of equation. What's the equation? Well, there's that equation that like, like psi sub P plus psi sub S equals psi total water potential, but we only have psi here. Yeah. So which way does water go? I guess it goes from areas of high water potential to low water potential. Yeah. I find it helpful to just draw this little table each time. So here's the little table, okay? So here's a little table, and this is the two different places. This is the sucrose solution, and this is the inside of the cell, okay? And there's the pressure potential and the solute potential in the total, pressure solute total, okay? So this part over here is for what's going on in the sucrose, and this is what's going on in the cell. And they just gave us the total psi. So um, in a solution of 0.1 molar sucrose, the psi would be negative 0.23. And in the cell, it'd be negative 0.15. So which way does water want to go? Yep, you said it. Um, from higher water potential to lower water potential, okay? So which one of these numbers is smaller? Oh, I hate negative numbers. Ask somebody who's not a dog. I mean, I'll ask a bird. Ask the bird. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess negative 0.23 is smaller than negative 0.15 because it's more negative. Yeah, so that's smaller, right? So water movement is from areas with higher water potential to areas with lower water potential. So which number is higher? The cell. Which one's lower? The sucrose. Okay, so it's going from the cell out into the solution, isn't it? Yeah. All right, so you get the right answer? Yeah. So it'd be from the tissue into the sucrose, okay? All right. So let's, why did I tell you all this stuff? Well, okay, so let's talk about water potential over the entire body of the plant, okay? So water potential in moist soil is usually high relative to water potential in the plant's roots. Where does water want to go? High to low. High to low, right? So it wants to go from the soil into the root. Oh, you just said this part. Yeah, water moves from areas of high water potential to low water potential, so it goes into the roots. Yeah. Um, sometimes you can end up with a plant not doing very well because um, you have low water potential in the soil, and so that could be caused by having a really salty soil with lots of solute concentrations, right? Or sometimes you have water that sticks to soil particles in dry soil, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Sometimes you can have um, um, irrigation that washes material into the soil. And so all of these things cause the soil to have low water potential. And so that could actually cause the water in the plant's roots to get leached out into the soil, or at least for the water not to want to go into the plant's roots. All right, so water moves from areas of? High. Water potential to areas of? Low. Water potential. So if it's very salty, dry, or diluted, which way does the water go? It goes out of the plant. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, the water vapor in the atmosphere, you know, the gaseous water, has no solute potential. No solute potential, right? There's no, no solute in it. It's just, a, you know, water. Just gaseous water, okay? So um, the water potential of water in the atmosphere is going to depend entirely on pressure potential. So there's, no gonna, there's gonna be no effect of solute on the water in the air. 
Um, so you could end up with low pressure potential and low water potential when the air is very, very dry. So there's relatively few water molecules. Okay, so water's like able to move around a lot. Um, and um, sometimes if it gets very hot as well, that the water molecules will move far apart from each other because they are, you know, the molecules are excited because it's hot outside. Okay. All right. So um, if you have warm, dry air, then the air is going to have a very low water potential. Okay. All right. So water is more likely to leave a leaf when the air is which? Warm or cold? Warm. Yeah, warm. Dry or moist? Dry! Yeah. Water moves from areas of? High! Water potential do? Low! Water potential. Okay, you got it. Alright, so the reason why I'm telling you all this stuff is that um, I'm trying to explain to you how water gets from the roots into the shoots of the tree. So water potential tends to be the highest in the soil. Okay? Um, so if it's if it's a uh, moist soil, it's going to be really high, you know, it's going to be relatively low if it's really dry soil. And then the root is going to be kind of medium high, right? So it's lower water potential than in the, than in the soil. The leaf is going to be even lower. The, and then the atmosphere is going to be even lower. Okay. So which way does water go? From high to low. Right, so the water is going to want to go from the soil into the roots, from the roots up into the leaves, and from the leaves out into the atmosphere, okay? So that sets up a water potential gradient between the roots and the shoots. So there's a difference in water potential from the roots to the shoots. Um, so to move up a plant, the water is, we say that the water is moving down the water potential gradient, okay? You may remember this when we did this in 1113. We say that um, that substances move down their concentration gradient. Why do we say this? I have no idea, right? And it makes it even more confusing when we're talking about water potential. But we would always say, you know, that substances like they diffuse down their concentration gradient. They go from where it's more concentrated to less concentrated, right? Anyway, move it. Water is moving down the water potential um, gradient that exists between the soil, the tissues, and the atmosphere. Um, and so when it does that, it replaces the water lost through transpiration, okay? Um, so water is lost, you know, through the leaves, but it's taken up from the roots. Okay, um, so biologists have examined in great detail three major hypotheses for how water could be getting from the roots all the way up to the shoots. I mean, especially if you think about like a big tall tree, what could cause that? Um, so three different ideas, root pressure, capillary action, and cohesion tension have all been examined in detail. Um, so um, there is a, there is a um, phenomenon called guttation, and this is when root pressure can force water droplets out of leaf margins. So the, the kind of difference in water potential um, from the roots to the shoots to the leaves is actually enough that it can actually force water out of the leaves. Um, so that is caused by root pressure. And this happens when the stomata are closed at night to avoid water loss, but the roots still can, um, will continue to accumulate ions from the soil. And then um, because of the ions and the, you know, the, that are inside the roots, the root cells, that lowers the water potential of the xylem and it draws water in from nearby cells. And that is enough to create positive pressure that forces water up the xylem and up and out of the leaves. So sometimes if you come out in the morning, you can see plants that have guttation around the edges. All right, the second mechanism that could cause water to be able to move from roots to shoots is capillary action. And so capillary action is uh, just a pro uh, something that you see in physics. It's just how water moves up a narrow tube um, due to the forces of adhesion, surface tension, and cohesion. So adhesion um, is when you have molecules that are sticking to and another kind of a substance. So in this case, it's the molecules of water that are sticking to the sides of the tube. Um, surface tension is um, an upward pull at the top of the water column. So it's um, kind of 
a pro it's kind of a mechanism that minimizes the air water interface. Um, and then cohesion is pull between the different molecules of the same substance. Okay, so what ends up happening is that the water molecules are held to each other by cohesion, they're held to the sides of the tube by adhesion, and then um, the entire thing is pulled up as a giant column because the surface tension kind of keeps, keeps the, the top of it smooth. Um, but it should be noted that root pressure, you know, like we just talked about with guttation and capillary action, they move water, but they can only do it for limited distances, right? So, you know, like if you go and drink a soda and you have a straw, um, sometimes capillary action will draw the water up the straw, you know, higher than the level of the drink. Um, but it doesn't make it go all the way out of the straw. It wouldn't explain how you can get water all the way up from the roots to the shoots. All right, so the third idea, which is um, a little bit more likely to explain more of the um, amount of water that's being brought up from the plant, is called the cohesion tension theory. And so this is the idea that um, at the surface of the leaf, right, so here is the surface of the leaf, there is a meniscus, right, so this is the, the water um, surface tension, right, at the surface of the, here's the leaf, this is the where the water kind of meets the air, okay, and so um, particle, molecules of water are evaporating from inside of the leaf out into the air, okay, so here we go. Well, I guess it's showing it in detail. So this is actually happening up at the surface here, and then it's going out the hole of the stoma. All right, so the water vapor is, is diffusing out of the leaf into the atmosphere. Um, so water evaporates inside the leaf, which kind of leaves a vacuum. And then that vacuum of gas created by the water evaporating is pulled out of the xylem. So here's the cross section of the leaf, and this is the xylem. So these are the little tubes. So water is pulled up the xylem, and then if you go even further down, you know, or go down, down, down the xylem to the bottom here, you can see water is being pulled out of the root cells, and then water is being then pulled from the soil into the root. So basically, um, this gas evaporation causes a vacuum, right, which pulls water out of the xylem, which pulls it all the way down the entire trunk, and then out of the root cell, which pulls water from the soil into the root. Um, so what properties make this pulling force from the leaf surface to the root possible? The first is that um, due to surface tension, cohesion, and adhesion, um, you get this continuous column of water that's being pulled through the entire plant. Um, and yeah, due to cohesion and adhesion. All right, so tree A is 5 meters tall and tree B is 10 meters tall. Which tree has to expend more energy to move water up the trunk due to cohesion, tension, and transpiration? Oh, this is a, I, hmm, hmm, I think it's the taller tree. Okay, taller tree, what do you guys think? I think they don't need energy to do this. I think that it's like, um, yeah, it doesn't cost any energy. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't cost any energy, right? Yeah, there's no ATPs or anything involved. Yeah. It's all just a process caused by evaporation of water from the leaves, drawing water up through the entire plant, right? Yeah. So if it's a big tree, it just got more leaves. Yeah, it's just got more leaves. Okay, yes, that's the answer. The answer is D. All right, so the water that is in a column of xylem cells is moving by bulk flow, meaning it's like a mass movement along a pressure gradient. Um, and so the tension at each meniscus, meaning the surface where the water meets the air, is very small, but there are millions of different places where water meets air in the entire plant, and so that tension will create a steep enough water potential gradient between the leaves and the roots to be able to deal with the incredible force of gravity and to pull water up long distances. Um, one property that allows plants to be able to do this is the secondary cell walls in the tracheids and vessel elements in the xylem, which are very heavily reinforced, and that allows these cells to withstand all this negative pressure without collapsing, right? So you're basically sucking on them, and instead of them collapsing, they have, um, the, they have the cellulose and glignin to keep them, um, to keep them rigid. 
Okay, so that was the first half of the chapter. The second half deals with translocation of sugars. So um, the first half was transpiration, meaning the movement of water. Second, translocation is the movement of sugars from the source to the sink. Okay, the source is where the sugar is made, the sink is where it's being used. And the kind of pipeline that it moves through is the phloem of the plant. Okay, so the source is the tissue where the sugar enters the phloem, and then the sink is the tissue where the sugar exits the phloem. So we would say that um, a place that's a source is very high in sugar concentration, and a place that is a sink would be very low in sugar concentration. And um, the source in the sink in, a, in the same plant can vary from, you know, one part of the season to another. So very early in the growing season, right? So maybe the plant is just like a mess of roots that are left over from the previous year, and the roots are all storing up all the sugars from the previous year's photosynthesis, right? But the plant doesn't have any leaves yet, so it's not photosynthesizing. So um, all of the storage cells in the roots and the stems are going to be the sources, and it's going to take all that sugar and put them into the developing leaves, right? But then, once the leaves grow and they're able to photosynthesize, um, then, then they're basically the source, right? The mature leaves and stems that are photosynthesizing become the source, and then the meristems, developing leaves, flowers, seeds, fruits, and storage cells in the roots become the sinks. Those are the places where the energy is needed. All right, remember phloem? No! I, I wish you would. Uh, well, wish, but I can't do it. Well, what are the two types of um, cells in phloem? Oh, I remember one of them is a companion cell. A dog is like man's best friend. And maybe a companion cell is the other kind of cell's best friend. Okay. We got the companion cell. I remember it had the word sieve in it. Yeah. And what shape does it have? It's like a tube. Yeah. All right. So there are sieve tube elements and companion cells. So these big ones are the sieve tube elements. And then these ones off the side here. I don't know why, but it looks like an eye with lots of worry lines around it. I believe that's the nucleus with the um, rough endoplasmic reticulum surrounding it. Anyway, um, that's the companion cell. What are the holes called that connect the two cell types? Plasmodesmata. Yeah, plasmodesmata. And what's the name for the circular surface with holes that flow and passes through? Oh, that's like a, a sieve tube. Mm. Hole. Sieve plate? Yeah, sieve plate. Okay. Um, so our hypothesis for how the um, phloem gets moved around is called the pressure flow hypothesis. Okay, that explains how sugars are moved around the phloem. So there are different events that happen at source and sink tissues that create a pressure potential gradient in the phloem. And then the water in the phloem sap moves down this pressure gradient. And then the sugars become, uh, just become carried along by the bulk flow. Um, so you have differences in turgor, meaning like the pressure of how big the cells are getting from, you know, how full they are. Differences in turgor in the flow near the source and the sink can generate the necessary force. Um, and then the trick is that you have to be able to create the differences in turgor pressure to get to set this whole thing off. And so in order to do that, the plant actually does have to expend energy to be able to um, alter the turgor pressure. Okay, so the process of, mo of bulk moving the phloem is called phloem loading and unloading. So in phloem loading, um, the sucrose, so here's the sucrose, it's actively transported from the source cell. So let's just say this is a leaf cell. So it's photosynthesizing and making sugars, which are those little red dots, okay? So those are being transported through the companion cell over here into the, into the sieve, um, sieve element, okay, sieve tube element. All right, so now this area over here is really sugary, right? And over here in the xylem, no sugar. So the water is drawn from the xylem into the phloem here where it's really sugary, right? And then more water, more water and more water comes in, and now there's a lot of turgor pressure. And so then that's going to kind of squirt all of the, you know, water with all the sugar stuck in it somewhere. So it's going to squirt it over here, okay? And this happens to be in the direction of the sink. 
And so the sink is a root cell that, that needs the, the, um, the sucrose, okay? And so then the, the sugar will accumulate over here. Um, as the sugar moves out, these cells have less solute potential, right? So the water is going to be less, you know, the water isn't going to want to be in here anymore uh, once it's not sugary anymore, and then the water will leave and go back into the xylem. Um, oh yeah, so sorry. So phloem unloading is the process in which the cells in the sink remove the sucrose from the phloem sap, right? Which is what happens over here. Um, and that could be, like I just said, due to loss of solutes. And then the water will flow passively in the trigger pressure and the sieve tube element drops and the water is gone, okay? All right, um, so some things that happen because of phloem loading and unloading, you end up with high turgor pressure near the source, right? It's very sugary, so water comes in, and then the cell is like really, really full, right? So there's a lot of pressure. Um, over here, you end up with low turgor pressure near the sink, and then that drives the water to go from here to here. Just the physical pressure of it being, the water's all crammed in over here, but not over here. So this makes a one-way flow of sucrose, but the water is in kind of a continuous loop, okay? So the water doesn't leave the plant, it just moves from areas where there's a source to areas where it's a sink and then goes back into the xylem. All right, well, if we had been here in person, I would make you act this out. I'm not sure if I want to do that. I'm not wearing a bathing suit. Okay, well, maybe we can see if we can do this some other time then. Okay, and I also ate 30 minutes ago, so I might get a cramp. Okay. Um, so I hope in this chapter you have learned how plants use evaporation and active transport to move materials long distances um, by looking at water potential and the factors that affect it. Um, that explains forces that move water from roots to shoots and features that reduce water loss. Also the translocation of sugars um, by looking at, at the pressure flow hypothesis um, and flow unloading and unloading from sources and sinks.